you see that, that's complete darkness. That is one of the key factors for getting good night's sleep. Today we speak with Mark, the co-founder and CEO of Sleepout, the world's best portable blackout curtain. Mark and Hannah started Sleepout over a year ago, during the beginning of COVID, and like many others, had a problem they believed they could create a more innovative and better solution. And they are redefining the blackout curtain market. Today's episode, we go over really the, some of the challenges that come with starting a business, especially starting a business with a partner, someone you see every single day, and really how you're able to separate work life from having a real life. As well, we go over some of the challenges of logistics and how we got into manufacturing. Both Mark and Hannah really come from a you know, tech background. So how were they able to develop a consumer product? How were they able to market it and really grow the business from nothing to the success it is having today? Hope you guys enjoy this episode, learn a bit more about the importance of sleep and how it's one of the key factors for being successful, not only in work, but also in life itself. Enjoy the episode and please subscribe below. Hope you guys enjoy. I'm Mark Coombs. I'm the co-founder of Sleepout. And what Sleepout is, we're a portable blackout curtain company um, right now, but we actually have some other sleep products coming in. Um, we've got some other adventures. I can't go too deep into those because mm-hmm. we're filing provisional patents for them. Um, but it, it's it's a business that was started during the pandemic with my partner and I, uh, largely because of my own insomnia. So always mm-hmm. been somebody who's super light sensitive and needed uh, a blackout solution of my own as a renter and kind of just we never could find one, hit a breaking point, and then just spent some of the pandemic inventing something while working at uh, my software job regularly, and then um, ended up launching it. And it's it's taken off quite a bit from here. So that's a, a little bit of the background. Well, and I mean, like many others, like the COVID pandemic caused a lot of different changes. Were, do you already kind of, were you entrepreneur, entrepreneurial in your past? Did you or you work on side projects, I, don't know, I guess the term is now side hustles, or was this something new you went to explore during the uh, pandemic times? I think the pandemic pushed a lot of people, including me, to, I, I'd always wanted to be more entrepreneurial. So I, I'm actually a lawyer and got pulled into a very early stage uh, legal tech startup called Blue Jay Legal. And that's where um, a lot of the learnings for startups happened with me. But I'd, I'd run smaller businesses as a kid, like for landscaping and other things like that, but nothing really serious until the pandemic hit. Had a bunch of free time, like a lot of other people in Toronto was locked down in my apartment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were kind of like, if we're going to do anything, if we're going to try to run any kind of business now, we should really launch something. So we, we looked through a couple of different ideas. And one morning at 4 a.m., my blackout setup with like a shower curtain rod came mm-hmm. crashing down. And we were kind of like, well, I kind of have to do something about this anyway. So why don't we look further into this? And so you said, so that happens. You're like, let's look into this problem. Is the intention to start a business or was it really just in the beginning to say, hey, I want to fix my current problem? Or like, I guess, how soon did the problem solving really turn into, like, hey, let's try to form a business here. Was it right away or was there a little bit more of a product development? Then you're like, oh, I can maybe try selling this to other people. I think there was, yeah, so we definitely, we knew it was our own problem. There was an analysis that we did where we looked at um, Amazon. If you get um, things like Jungle Scout or Helium 10, you can look at the sales rates of different Amazon products. And we bought a couple um, baby products because that's what there were at this time. These portable blackout curtains were largely like mostly for babies and for for young kids. And we saw that um, they were actually selling really, really well, but they had awful reviews. And then we just decided to read a lot of the negative reviews. Um, and then we realized that those negative reviews were like exactly what we were experiencing. They were mm-hmm. difficult to put up. They had light bleeds all over them. They'd fall down in the middle of the night. Um, and so we, from there, we were like, okay, this is a problem. And obviously there's a, a broader market than just us. Um, and, but from there, it was really, can we do this? Like, can we actually build something that's better than this? And so we, like, we had no experience in product development other than mm-hmm. us both working in software. Um, And so we actually just ended up reaching out to people from like Shark Tank and Dragon's Den. (laughs) We ended up reaching out to like five or 10 of those people who had products that use suction cup applications. A few of them got on with us and just talked to us about where to start. And then from there, we kind of just worked with a prototyping firm here in Ontario for a while around suction cups and just figured out um, that we could probably build like an industrial strength suction cup that would not fall down. Mm -hmm. Um, Wow. So I guess, so when it comes to developing the product was it sounds like the suction cup was one of the big sticking, no pun intended, like one of the big sticking points. I guess that seems a little more challenging than almost the blackout curtain itself. So it's just that suction cups tend to not be that 
good on the more more cons, uh, commercial goods just because they're not made to hold things or kind of how did or when you were trying to develop it yourself you realized that things kept falling down like how did yeah. you get into this whole suction cup uh research Su suction cups are actually a challenge in that when you're basing any kind of weight on them they tend to mm -hmm. fall so you're, you think of the typical push in suction cups when mm -hmm. you push it in and the, these other curtains had like 50 of those um there are other innovations like desk view or vertiball that use really powerful le levered suction cups where you could put them onto a window. They wouldn't break the window, but you could put a lot of weight onto them. Like we saw some of these other applications, they were able to put, you know, a whole person on top of one of them. Um, and so we talked to those people and we're like, okay, how does this work? How, how can we do this? And then we worked with our prototyping firm to kind of create a design that was our own, that would really work uh, for blackout fabric because the other thing around darkening windows is you've got to get every bit of light around it. And so we ended up creating a curve at the top of our section cup. Mm -hmm. um, so the blackout fabric will be placed the closest possible to the window and actually curve and block that top light bleed. Mm -hmm. We had to make it wide enough so that it wouldn't peel off on either side. And then we figured out um, some other aspects around the blackout fabric too, because we actually found out just a whole bunch about um, blackout fabric as well. And that our fabric we could make that would actually be 100% versus a lot of the other ones, which were like turned out when you actually looked under any kind of um, 10,000 lux light was like, mm -hmm. they were like 70 to 80% blackout. So there's actually a lot of improvement to be made. Um, mm -hmm. And we just kind of kept going and, and adding things as we went. It, it was just like, it was an area, if you think about like curtains or window treatments that really hadn't been innovated on for a really long time. Yeah. It's it's always interesting, especially talking to people on this podcast where things is like, there's innovation everywhere. Like a lot of these products, people think like, oh, I mean, the classic example, um, I, you know, me and myself going to business school and going again to business school to get my MBA. They always give the fancy example with like the toilet paper. I forget what it's called. It's like $500 toilet paper, but it's like anything can be innovated if you're smart enough. And if you approach it properly, like every market can, it can expand. And it's the same thing like you're saying with like, uh, you know, curtains and you know, other fixtures is there is room for innovation. So when you start developing this, like, I mean, COVID's been around for a while now, but I guess do things are ramping up really quickly? Do you start putting money into it? Like at what point do you start realizing, Hey, this, you know, fun, you know, maybe idea, something we're working on could turn into a real business that, you know, we really have to put a lot more effort into. Was it pretty early on this in this stage or once more of the product was developed, did it start becoming a little more serious of your time? Yeah. I think the biggest leap is usually quitting jobs, especially we had pretty mm -hmm. high paying jobs. Like she worked at like Hannah was my partner worked at mm -hmm. IBM and, and I worked at another legal tech startup and, um, I think we, we got excited about it when we created our own prototypes that worked mm -hmm. well for us. Like we would remember, okay, we want to put this up every night and we want to take it with us. So that was mm -hmm. the first part. But I think we'd, we'd actually run some tests online through Facebook ads and hot jars. So we just, mm -hmm. we set up a landing page and I was like, okay, I've got to see if we can actually generate a decent amount of income on this. So if we just put up this yeah. landing page today, taking pictures of our product and maybe mm -hmm. splicing in some stuff that doesn't exist yet and just hit add to cart. And we mm -hmm. can't actually take payments yet because we don't have product to sell, but yeah. basically put up a mock page, drove traffic to it, uh, watched it through Hotjar and just saw how many people mm -hmm. would buy, like literally if we launched this today and the rates were good. Like we, it didn't cost us very much to acquire a customer. We realized like if we target the right audiences, it could work. And from then on, we were like, okay, I think we actually have something here because there are people um, putting in information ready to purchase mm -hmm. on, on this mock page. I'm so happy. So I, I've always said, uh, and I guess this was like the, um, kind of going to Laurier and stuff. Their approach was always like develop MVP, get as close as you can to getting, you know, cut money in your hand. And one thing I always used to, cause I, you know, I buy some startups. It's like that mock page, see what people click, see what happens. Just kind of not, I guess the fake it till you make it thing, but like, just develop the landing page and see what happens. And it's good to hear that you had that process as well, because I think one of the big things is that I always found that, Pete, especially when it comes to like starting a startup, there's like, like you said, there's a like different stages. You, you can get to like almost a tipping off point where the, there's still risk, but you're minimizing the risk by like how you said, how you're like, Hey, let's throw up a landing page and see what happens. Let's test, see if there is, if there is any need for the property, if there's any interest when you were doing that, was there a, like you just threw the wet lane page up. Do you have to figure out marketing or did you have some marketing experience or was it really just organic at the time? No, it, like exactly that too. And that, one of the most critical things I would say is like, you should be kind of ashamed of the first bit of the, like the first thing you put up should be a landing page that you designed in like 
five hours, which it was, right? Like we took a couple of photos, it looked awful. Um, we put it up, it had some language around it about what mm -hmm. it was. And then we went on Facebook and just drove some traffic to it for not very much money. But that, then even following that, like what we did to also validate was mm -hmm. we built prototypes with clay. Like we made the clay suction cup design and we ended up selling those prototypes. And we told those people like, Hey, like if you really hate this, like, we'll give you your money back later. Yeah. But we, we sold them. And it was, like, scary. Because we were like, we, you know, we stitched a lot of this stuff ourselves. Mm -hmm. We work with George Brown College mm -hmm. in Toronto to do some stitching on some blackout fabric. But these clay suck. Like, it looked awful. Um, mm -hmm. But we sold them. And only one person out of the, I think, the six that we sold to ended up wanting their money back. The other people liked it so much. And by that point, we are like, okay, we can actually sell something here. And by the way, we, we did the exact same process with the next invention that we're launching, mm -hmm. where we sold this prototype that was, like, very... We went to our audience and he said, you've got to sign an NDA because we haven't filed a patent for this yet, yeah. but we'll sell you this prototype for basically its costs and give us your feedback. And some people hated the prototype and gave mm -hmm. us a bunch of really valuable feedback and other people said it was amazing. But I think the faster that you can get to that like actual validated mm -hmm. feedback, not talking to your friends and family or whoever is going to say, you know, oh, it's a brilliant idea. Go for it. As soon as you can get to somebody and say like, okay, pay me 50 bucks for this or a hundred bucks yeah. for this. And they actually pay you money for that. Um, that, that's the only real validation that you can have, I think, like mm -hmm. in any kind of business. And I think what you said right there is like, make them pay you. I think one of the big sticking points, a lot of people is they'll give their product away for free and they'll be like, well, there was no complaints. Like people yeah. loved it. Or like, Hey, like, yeah, I'll buy it. Like, Oh, for sure. I'd pay a hundred dollars for this. And then people are like, yeah, I have all these made up purchase orders. But then you're like, okay, when you go to collect, everyone's like, ah, well, I'm not sure. So uh, what you were saying, we're like, w make people pay you. And even if you, like you said, even if you think it's a little crappy, like, Hey, this is not our best product. It, you have to just get that feedback. And if people put money in, they will for sure give you feedback because they're now financially involved. And they'll say, Hey, I paid you 50 bucks for this. This is crap. A, you know, A, B, C, and D. And then at least you get that feedback where the family and friend is always like, love the idea. It's such yeah. a great idea. Oh, great idea. Oh. And then you're like, okay, cool. Do you want to pay me? And they're like, well, no. No, I, I don't give you money there. Well, it's not, can't be that great then. So I think your approach iteration makes a lot of sense, but also takes out the risk and also demystifies like, will people be willing to pay by actually getting people to pay? So you, st you get some hype now. There's some interest. You know, this is a real business. How do you, uh, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you're primarily from the a little more of the tech background. How do you start manufacturing, looking into manufacturing? I feel that's like a whole spooky system. Do you look locally? Do you have to like look over? Like, how does that whole world come to be? Do you just start? How do you start on that adventure? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Like we had to learn everything there and including mm -hmm. the supply chain and freight and getting stuff moved. So that was just a lot of phone calls from people who were way ahead of mm -hmm. us. We would, And I think that one of our biggest learnings too is entrepreneurs that are starting a new business is like, people are willing to talk to you. Like people, like we talked to both of the co-founders of ND um, who just were willing to get on the phone with us. Like a bunch of these different companies, people were willing to help us out super early and really got us six months ahead just by talking to people who knew their stuff. Yeah, but in terms of actually manufacturing it, we did discuss with tons of Canadian uh, manufacturers to try to get it done here. The sad reality was that the, the like textile industry just doesn't even really exist in Canada anymore. Went to the States and it's almost gone there too. And to get the certifications mm -hmm. for the high level blackout that we wanted, um, we had to go overseas with it. And then like, then you deal with the issues, right? Of not actually being able to go. Cause one of the most important things if you're manufacturing in China is visiting your factory, right? You need to vet mm -hmm. everything that's going on, especially when you're making these huge purchase orders. Um, we essentially got lucky and had a connection with an amazing mm -hmm. factory there. It was another entrepreneur, uh, someone we'd connected with early on who had a similar product, who essentially kind of gave us contact to one of his factories. Um, and another person who'd been really long in the blackout industry who said, this is one of the best blackout factories in the world. And I shouldn't even be telling you their name, but here's their name. And like, it was really purely networking that got us those mm -hmm. connections. Otherwise we would be in a, diff a totally different stage right now. Like it would be. Uh, we'd be way slower. We wouldn't have our product out to market and we definitely wouldn't have all the units that we have of it. Um, it, it was really just calling people and trying to learn from them as fast as possible. I think, I, I, I mean, that's what we, something you always hear is like network, have those coffee chats, have those coffee chats. And I think what's funny is it, it's like, I always compare it to the example of like, when people say like, how do you get in shape? The answer is like, work out. It's like, no, but like, give me the answer, like, be active. 
but it's like hard to do. Same with networking. I always find it's like, if you're like, how do you become successful? Or at least how do you get more successful? They're always like, well, network, but they're like, but that's hard. Or that's the point, like making those phone calls. But, but what you were saying is I, what, from my experience is relatively true. Like people are happy to speak to you most of the time. Uh, although there is some rejection here and there, but people tend to be quite happy to give their wisdom. I think everyone likes to be the person giving feedback or kind of mentoring someone else. It's always nice to give back, but at the same time, it is a little bit of a grind sometimes figuring out who to talk to and similar to selling your product, kind of putting your neck on the line and being like, hi, you don't know me, but can I have 15 minutes of your time to ask you questions? You're really getting nothing from me in return. There's no, I don't have any feedback. I have, I'm brand new to here, but I found that the conversations tend to go well and it, we tend to build pretty deep relationships relatively fast. So it's nice to hear you've had a you know, similar experience, especially within this pretty tight or small entrepreneurship world, especially within Canada and across uh, different industries. Yeah, I so, think that entrepreneurs in particular are always willing. Like they, we all remember what it's like to literally just start out with an idea and have yeah. no way to make it. Um, so yeah, I, like I'm stoked to always have those conversations now too. I think it's always nice because everyone wasn't like that signed their first product. Everyone remembers it. Um, it's the same thing. I found like a lot of students looking for jobs. It's like, hey, I'm a student looking for my first job. Everyone's been there. So everyone's like, I will talk to you. I remember that pain uh, trying to figure out how to get through the corporate world. So you you start developing. The ha- so like I guess you said before, when developing this, this product, it was primarily on Amazon, really focused on the babies. Little, I guess, because they need to be darker or at least easy for sleeping what did you find that was there a lot of education within the market or was it something when you know describing your product to other people everyone kind of understood the value and understood how how i guess how it works makes sense but like understood the value you're bringing with it or was there some education you had to do with your initial customers to tell them kind of how was this better or how does this impact sleep quality yeah, I think there's a couple a couple points there. Amazon had the defined market, right? So baby, so yeah, babies. The the issue um, that parents often have with young children is they put them down for naps, or they need them to have darkness in the middle of the day to get them to sleep, and they want them to sleep a little bit longer in the mornings because they're usually so sleep deprived themselves. And if if your baby ends up waking up before you do, like you're you're done, you're going to be up all day. So they had a pretty like that market was very educated on this problem and had been using all sorts of solutions from tinfoil to garbage bags to like everything um, for a very, very long time. Um, similar with night shift workers. So my mom actually is a, is a nurse who worked night shifts. So any third shift worker was also um, looking for some type of solution to black out their room. They were well-educated and people who suffered from insomnia like me. Um, so those were the ones that we tended to go after immediately, the ones that already knew the problem really well and that were already looking for solutions, except all the solutions that existed were really bad. (laughs) Generally, you can either buy this, like, um, you know, the one from Amazon that falls down every night, or you, what most people did is actually just DIY cardboard and tinfoil and, you know, some other form of duct tape. Um, so for them, once they saw ours, it was actually pretty easy for other people that we saw coming through, um, there wasn't like we ran Kickstarter, which was our first major sales event. Uh, and like a lot of people used it for use cases that we didn't even originally imagine, like people uh, trying to block out light during Zoom calls during the pandemic or people who were like professional gamers trying to game in their room in the dark or people who were actually working in movie sets that needed to darken areas. So that was cool to kind of learn about. Mm-hmm. But I think our core markets are probably going to stay the same, at least for the next little bit, which mm-hmm. is really going to be around those parents and, and night shift workers and, and people suffering from sleep trouble. Mm-hmm. It's always interesting when you develop a product, the use cases you never think of as the creator. Um, just because it's, you always think like, oh, I, you know, I developed the product. This is the market. This is, you know, the need I'm trying to solve. And then you realize there's, I mean, some products you see that the whole company shifts completely because they realize, oh, I'm solving a much bigger issue. Instead of you know, serving the 1% of this group, I can serve 99% of this bigger group. So it's always interesting learning from there. How, when developing the product though, I mean, from what it sounds like, like developing anything that can block out light has to be relatively thick. There's a lot of process to it. Was there a trade-off you had to look at like the price versus, not quality, but price versus like usefulness or utility? Because I feel like you know, for ten thousand dollars, you can solve any problem. But for trying to get the price down, like, how did you make that trade off? Was there a point of like, hey, this is the minimum requirement we require? Anything else is greater, or was there like a price point you were trying to fit in? Like, how did was the price was it 
was it gone by value first or was you looking for a price point you're trying to hit or how did that kind of become to be? No. And we had different conversations with some, like some pretty amazing people who are on both sides of that. Like some people are just like, look, it's this product. Like, so generally the retailers or people that had worked in like kind of mass sales in store mm-hmm. were very much like, it's this type of product. It's got to be this price on this shelf. And, you know, you've got three seconds at that price. And they were very much like that. But we'd also talked to a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs who had done very well. So thinking about Envy and thinking about even like Hush from just did a deal with Sleep Country recently. Yeah, uh, qual- we, we decided to focus really heavily on quality. Like we went with the best factory. We, we bought the best blackout fabric that you can get. That's Ocotech certified and Green Guard certified. It's actually like triple coated. Like you cannot get light through this at all. Um, and so far that that's paid off. Like we want it to be known as when you buy from us, you get the best possible and mm-hmm. it's worth the money. Um, could, we actually had a situation where we could have switched the fabric out and cut a lot of cost at the bottom. And that just didn't feel right to us for what our brand was, was going to be speaking about, especially when it came to like parents and the thing, I think it's actually kind of paid off a lot. Like we're getting just insane word of mouth about the fabric alone when people open it and feel how quality it is and actually like yeah. put it up on their windows. And like a new market has opened up for us actually that we never thought would happen because our product is so like actually like you can take it anywhere and use it, which is athletes. Like Hannah and I just decided one night right before the Olympics, it's like, okay, why don't we just DM a couple Olympians and see if they would want this before they before they go to Beijing. We ended up getting in touch with over 10 of them. And one of the, one of the captains of like the women's curling team like wrote us back and she's like, I heard two of my teammates are getting a sleep out curtain. Like, can you get me one? And we're like, yeah, we can get you one. We're going to nail this next day and get it to you. So like, this is just happening for us, right? Like mm-hmm. we're actually just getting into the athlete world as well. And now we're talking to other professional athletes too. But I think had we tried to just cut back quality and been like, oh, our market is this and they're going to be in this retail store. And so we want it to be Sixty dollars. I think we would have missed out on a bunch of other stuff. I think we're, I think we wanted to go for the for the high quality play as much as possible. And I think that's what's really cool. With like developing e commerce and even kind of the shift is that you can control now the price to some extent. Because if you're just going on the shelf, like you said, the distributors are like, hey, this is a you know twenty dollar product. It's all on price because you have to move hundreds of thousands of units. So like we can't speak speak to your product any better. You have to be able to like like the WalMarts like, hey. A and B, they are the same thing. You, the user is just going to choose and it becomes very difficult. I spoke to a lot of people, especially within, surprisingly in Canada, everyone's in the a lot, food industry is very big here as well. As, and mm-hmm. the whole thing is like a lot of these newer healthy products, the issue is, is shelf space because yeah. they're, they're healthier. They're more expensive. But how do you educate the consumer on why it's better? And that's always a big challenge if you can't go direct to consumer is how can you show your value for 2X, the one be, you know, the product you're put beside, even though you may not be the exact same thing which is always an interesting challenge in the uh, manufacturing world. So this is, I get a little bit more of a, di- I guess, in- interesting or different question. With an entrepreneurship world, there's always that better or for worse, that grinding mentality that you sleep is for the week. No one should sleep. Every entrepreneur I spoke to says, hey, the biggest thing to success is sleeping. Like you need your eight hour. Some days are longer days, but like you need to sleep for long-term success. How are, I feel like having a company that especially ties into sleep, how is that conversation? Do you find it's a little bit of a misnomer or incorrect that entrepreneurs don't sleep? Or do you think it's one of those things that as education and sleep science gets better, people start realizing that to be successful over long terms, you need more sleep within your life? Yeah, it's such a great question. And we have been lucky enough, actually, because we we host uh, sleep science events regularly with actually some of the best um, researchers in North America on sleep. And so um, we had Dr. Michael Grandner on and asked him something similar. He advises the U.S. Olympic team on sleep. Mm-hmm. And he was just kind of, <laughs> he was pretty candid that he thinks that the whole, you know, Silicon Valley, like, cut sleep to for performance thing is like, just categorically wrong he's like i'll put the studies in front of you on your decision making and your abilities and like go ahead and skip sleep and do this polyphasic sleep and do you know take these pills and do all this stuff to not sleep but eventually like the people that are sleeping the eight hours are going to outperform you i will Mm -hmm. say the interesting thing on being on the entrepreneurial side of it like while running a sleep company is just like there is that huge call and drive to just like why are we sleeping we're we're launching tomorrow we shouldn't be sleeping we shouldn't be so 
it's it's easy to say get your eight hours and you'll be smarter and han and i have to remind ourselves even though we're surrounded by the sleep science to do that um but you there is a culture of you know if you feel like you're not um doing everything for your business you it, it's it's scary and so it, it's something where i think it's just a cultural shift and we all have to talk about it a bit more and everybody has to be like no, sleeping for three hours a day like isn't cool. It's not. It's not going to help you, and it's not really going to help anyone around you. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's one of those things like you talk to younger people. And I guess it's the same thing with age, though. You tend not to need as much. You still need as much sleep. You just don't sleep as much when you're younger. Then, but then you talk to, I guess, more tenured entrepreneurs, and they're like, "Oh yeah, like a lot of times it's interesting. They're like they'll build into their schedules. Like, hey, no meetings between here. I need to sleep. Like my time off with my family. And you learn." What I've learned is for a lot of people, like a, a highest level is like everything's very like controlled. Like, hey, I'm time, I'm family time now, sleep time now, like off my computer at this time. And that sounds very robotic, but you learn to be efficient. Like, you can't just, you have to have some process and getting that rest, especially if there's travel or anything involved. I think it does burn you out incredibly, incredibly. And it's, it's such a misnomer. Like everyone's like, oh, like I'll need sleep. Or the classic, like you wake up at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. every day, but you're going to bed at 8 p.m. So it doesn't make a big difference. But it's just cool to say you wake up super early, even though if you want to go to sleep at the same child as a small baby, uh, funny enough. Um, but yeah, so the business is growing. Things look to go well. When, when going from the corporate to entrepreneurship, I know you touched on how Typically, one of the big stressors with an entrepreneur is that every minute you're not working, you feel like you're wasting to some extent. How are you able to manage that shift? And was there was there any things that were surprisingly easier than you thought being an entrepreneur versus kind of working the nine to five? And were there some things that were more challenging than you would ever expect? I think what you said right there is actually more challenging. Like the freedom is amazing and the ability to be creative and just instantly implement your ideas. So you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and they're like... There are people who might have gotten frustrated at a big at a bigger company because they see efficiencies and they see ways to do things, but it's going to be six to eight months before anything uh, actually like that could ever get done at a company uh, of a major size. And so, to actually just be able to have an idea or a new strategy and execute on it that day is really empowering. I think the challenge, especially where um, Hannah and I are partners and live together and sleep together every night, has been how do how do we separate sleep out from our daily lives. And we're still working on that. Like we have different rules about when we can talk about it in the bedroom or like, mm -hmm. can we talk about it, uh, you know, at certain times of night? And because it, it really is all consuming in a good, and it's not in a bad way. Like we wake up in the morning, we can't wait to get in front of the, wake up and get in front of the whiteboard. But it's, um, I th you have, you really are myopic, like when you're doing this and, and everything that you do goes into this and it's rewarding, but it's also, figuring out strategies to separate like a normal life or, or mm -hmm. trying to have some semblance of normal with it, I think is, I think it's challenging for every entrepreneur who really, really cares about their business. Yeah. I, f I feel a lot of people can feel very, have a little bit taste of that, especially if they're working from home, because the same similar thing is that when you're working from home, it's that your dining room or your you know breakfast table is not a place you have breakfast it's a place where you do your work and then trying to, yeah flip the switch and without the commute it's a similar thing where you can't just be like well i'm done work for the day it's the laptop still there the phone's still there um and it's funny enough one thing i i heard from some other entrepreneurs which i always thought was very funny until speaking to other people is that like they said one of the biggest skills they learned to develop was like how to relax effectively like there i said the biggest issue for them was that you can have like five hours watching tv but if your brain's still doing something or you're on your phone you're not really relaxing you're half-assing and i think the challenge is it's the same thing in entrepreneurship is that either you should figure out how to flip it on and off like you were saying like hey right now i'm you know i'm a human we're, we're having dinner together there's no phones it's really focused and then being like hey it's work time and i think one of the big burnouts is that that you always feel you're on 24 7 learning how to like roll like the classic saying is like study hard party hard everyone said but like figuring out how to actually like relax aggressively, like disconnect. And I think the greatest thing you see on like TikTok, love or hate TikTok was like, everyone's like walking for my mental health, but like going outside and going for a walk, I always thought was silly until you do it. And you're like, this is great. But then you never do it because you think it's a waste of time. Like I always, classic saying is that you never regret a workout. It's like, you never regret going for a walk. 
because you feel so relaxed. I think that's the same thing, like learning how to disconnect, especially if you're working from home or if you're an entrepreneur where you feel like you constantly have to uh, put being putting effort into something, even if you're not effective, even if you're working at 10%, it's better to take that time off and then reset. But really interesting here, especially kind of living together and your bit, it's like having a business and then also having a relationship is separate, but kind of tied in together because it's like both mutually beneficial. So yeah, it's super interesting. It's not very common as well. So that's interesting to hear. So I guess you have some success. Kind of what does the next you know stages look like? I know you said there are some other products you're developing, but like, how do you foresee the next year, a few years and kind of the growth of Sleep Out and uh, kind of expanding across? Yeah, I think it's been like, the growth's been amazing and the word of mouth has been nuts. Like we were on Instagram the other day and just saw somebody, it was a mom from the UK saying, oh, I can't believe you got one of those curtains. I, I can't wait till they open up here in the UK. And that was just surreal to us because literally one, like, yeah, less than one year ago, Hannah was still working at her job. And now we've gone through the development, the sales, and now we have thousands and thousands of these out globally. I think when you think of growth, it's really, there's two primary levers that I like to think about, which is like you're adding a sales channel or you're adding a new innovative product. Mm -hmm. And so we'll continue to do that, right? So our, our next stages will probably be to go into new sales channels like retail. So we've just got the e-commerce mm -hmm. set up now. Yeah. We'll go into retail next. Um, and we're going to continue to add new products. Like we've just finished this new invention. Mm -hmm. We're going to get it patented and we'll launch it probably, I want to say late spring, early summer. Mm -hmm. um, but that one is, is really big to us. Um, and we're really excited about it. And so I think that we'll look to continue to expand sleep out. We'll look to continue to grow the team, but it's really going to be around like our, I think that what differentiates our sleep brand is we don't just want to add like, I don't know, one like one nice fabric onto something. Mm -hmm. We actually want to have patents for everything we make. Like we actually want to have innovative stuff every single time we do something. So um, it's been cool to actually just work with industrial designers and kind of mm -hmm. rethink the way things are done around either the bed or window treatments. And, and we're going to keep doing that for a long time. And I guess another question, because it's kind of interesting, because you started during COVID and one of the big challenges with COVID was distribution and shipping and logistics because you kind of start at technically the worst time for logistics, like every, you can't buy a darn car, everything is out of stock. Is it getting better or like, was there challenges in the early days or did you just assume that's how it always was? Or was everyone like some of the housing market now where people are like, well, back in my day, like two years ago, it was much better. It was so much easier. Like, did you hear those war stories when you were starting or was it not that difficult to really, because that's kind of the only thing you knew at the time? Oh, for sure. It, it It's definitely been difficult for us, like for everybody else. I mean, the uncertainty around shipment times and when things are getting in and how clogged it is at customs. It looks like it's getting better now than it was last year, but only slightly expect this to last for another year. But I mean, on the good side of it is we've always had these crazy costs and stuff like this built into our margins and these crazy lag times. So once that switches, like I'm excited for that. I, we've only ever had like the most extreme, difficult, Mm -hmm. uh shipping climate ever so hopefully like that'll go back to normal we we get these yeah. like oh you ordered something and you actually get it you know a month and a half later and you get it at, at you know one fifth of the price um I, I think we'll do good with that if that shifts back that way and if it doesn't we're prepared for it that, that's always interesting it's like one thing starting a business during covid it's like this it's a little more difficult especially for manuf manufacturing anything logistics but if you can do it now you can really do it when things are relatively back to normal, I get like, don't it's only up from here to some extent, but I mean, super interesting story. Very, like you said, bringing in innovation to places that I typically wouldn't have thought of when people think of innovation, you, you know, typically think of tech or something, you like really metaverse, like futuristic, but there's innovation everywhere in entrepreneurship and everything you do. Um, I mean, other products like food science, all these other topics that are kind of getting more and more exciting and sleep being probably the hottest thing, especially with more literature coming out and big people speaking about the importance of sleep over the past few years, which sounds silly to me. I'm like, wait, we've been sleeping since we were a species, but now people are like, oh, sleep's good. Like this is beneficial. And I do think this is a growing market as silly as it sounds like sleep is like the future. Um, but if people want to follow your story and kind of get more involved and pick up the product, what's the uh, best social handles to uh, check out and what's the website? 
Yeah, I think for our story, we're very active on LinkedIn. So I would definitely say follow either myself or Hannah. We're constantly, we try to build in public and be as honest as we can, including all the, mm -hmm. the craziness. So we talk about everything there. Um, sleepoutcurtains.com if people want to check out the product. And then we're like, if they want more product information, it's at try sleep out on Instagram. But yeah, I would love for people to follow along the journey on LinkedIn. It's very cool. And thank you for, for having me, Brandon.